Hello, my name is Brian Hoffman, and I am the crypto platform product lead at Kraken. Today, we're going to be talking about parachain slot auctions, and I'm lucky enough to be joined here by Dan Reeser, who is the VP of Growth at Akala and Karura, and has previously worked at Web3 as a, as a key part of the Kusama and Polkadot launch teams. Uh, Dan, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So why don't you go ahead and um, just real quick before we get started, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and how you ended up at Akala and um, maybe a little bit about what you learned at Web3 and, and, and got you so excited about the Polkadot ecosystem. Yeah, definitely. So um, like you mentioned, I'm working on Akala and Karura. I've been here for about um, four or five months now, started at the beginning of the year. Um, I'm leading all of our growth and community efforts here now and did previous work um, at Web3 Foundation, working on the launches of Kusama and Polkadot. Um, I, having been a part of the Kusama kind of um, growth effort and community from the very beginning and late 2019, um, it's been pretty fun and exciting to watch this network really grow um, beyond any of our expectations. Um, we've got a lot of a lot of exciting things coming up for both Kusama and Polkadot. Um, being 2021, 20, I think these, these networks have now been under construction now for like three or four years. So a lot of brilliant developers research has gone into this and it's all been, been kind of leading up to this moment of kicking off um, the parachain auction process, which is basically how a blockchain launches on Kusama or on Polkadot afterwards. So looking forward to talking through all of that process with you today. Yeah, it's certainly pretty exciting to see this uh, just about to launch after watching Gavin do everything with the EVM and, and Ethereum. And, and now it's years later and we're, we're seeing a, another next generation network coming up. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. So why don't you go ahead and explain to us a little bit about what, like, what is Polkadot and Kusama? What is the relationship between these two? And, you know, give us some background on what, yeah. what were you trying to solve here? Yeah, so as you mentioned, um, Gavin Wood, one of the original co-founders, the original CTO of Ethereum and, and the guy who kind of invented and built the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine and the Solidity programming language. Um, around 2016, I believe, 2017, um, he, he moved on to start building um, Polkadot in the Substrate blockchain development framework. Um, his goal with this is to build a more scalable network of multiple blockchains that are all built kind of specialized for a specific purpose rather than Ethereum, which is a kind of a single isolated layer one blockchain that's done phenomenally well for, for the technology that it is. Um, what Polkadot is bringing into the, into the crypto you know, universe is this idea of a connected set of 100 or more um, blockchains, which we call parachains. You can see in this diagram here, this is kind of meant to show what that kind of looks like. You've got the core of Polkadot, which is what we call the relay chain. And then all these um, customized blockchains around connected in are called parachains. And then Kusama um, on the left here is what we call Polkadot's cousin network. It's really introducing this new concept in between a test net and kind of a full bank grade network that Polkadot is which is this innovation network or an experimental network where developers can um, launch products after they've been tested on testnet and get them into a real environment. Um, sometimes they will build on, on Kusama wanting to move to Polkadot after that, um, but other teams are actually building exclusively on Kusama because it, it moves a little bit faster. It allows some flexibility and um, you know, some flexibility to try things out and um, you know, test out new products. So, that's Kusama and Polkadot. Um, part of Kusama's kind of mantra is to expect chaos. It's this, what they call a canary network, which is um, comes from this reference of bringing a canary bird into a coal mine and, and seeing if the bird um, was affected by any gases in the coal mine. And if not, then it was safe for the miners to come in and start their, their work. Um, in that same fashion, Kusama is going to be launching first um, with this parachain slot auction process. And then once that's, um, you know, once we have a set of maybe five parachains live on Kusama, then Polkadot will begin the parachain slot auction process and parachains will begin to launch on Polkadot. 
So that kind of leads into our conversation today around a parachain slot auction. Um, what this actually is, is this is how one of these on this diagram, one of these little gray squares that you see around here connecting into the relay chain that I mentioned, this is how they actually launch on Kusama or launch on Polkadot. It's not like a, a free open environment like you saw with ERC-20 tokens where anyone could just come and, and build and launch a token. This requires a team who's building one of these blockchains, a parachain team, to actually win an auction against other teams who are also vying for that slot in the network. So you mean they can't just create a white paper and uh, and push out a smart contract and they're done. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the, obviously there's still, um, there's white papers and then it goes into significant amount of development that re is required yeah. to build the blockchain. And these teams, I, I, I guess I didn't mention, but the, what the teams are really coming here for, like the reason why there's teams willing to do all of this work is mainly for two reasons. With, with Polkadot and Kusama, you get these shared security or plug and play security of the network. So you don't have to go out and recruit your own set of network validators. And then the second reason is, as you can see with all these pink lines intersecting, there's data and value um, you know, interacting between these blockchains in this one unified network. So it's this concept of interoperability that we've been talking about in crypto for the last three to five years, but it's really coming to fruition now with these networks. So, I mean, help me understand a little bit more about like what like why is there such a thing as a slot auction like what 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 problem is that even trying to solve because it seems like there was plenty of capital that got sucked up through the ICOs you know several years back and there was no problem you know raising money in that respect yeah um, why why is this different and like like why are why is why is it like so much more um, kind of a, a detailed you know, like why, why is it so much more complicated mm -hmm. of a process? Yeah, it, it's really, I think, a, a factor of many things, like one, including Gavin's experience and, and several of the developers were kind of early Ethereum people seeing what happened um, on Ethereum with the ICOs that were so easy to just launch, take money and then never deliver on the promise. What this this is really a big kind of game theory experiment with requiring teams to have significant skin in the game um, to launch a parachain on this network to inherit that security um, and the interoperability of the network. And by creating a skin in the game, it significantly reduces the risk of teams just coming in this to try to get a quick buck, you know? Um, so this process is, it, it requires quite a bit of work for not only building the blockchain itself, but also there's a whole process in, in trying to figure out how you're going to get the funds to actually put up um, in the bid in this auction. And I know now, we're gonna, yeah, we'll get into details on that. I mean, my understanding here too, is that the funds that people are putting up for these, um, these slot auction bids, they're not actually going to the teams themselves, right? Yeah, so in, in these parachain auctions, there's two ways to participate as a team. One, you can just bid yourself if you already have um, KSM or, or DOT in Polkadot's case to, to bid. But most teams will, will do um, this, this kind of crowdsourced parachain slot auction process where they actually gather support from their community and then use that support as their bid in the auction. So if I'm contributing personally to one of these parachain slot auctions, the tokens that I contribute will be locked um, for the duration of that parachain team slot, but the team will actually never touch it. And then whenever that slot ends, I will be, my lot, my tokens will kind of be unlocked. Um, yeah, that's, that's so, like super yeah. interesting too, because I think in a lot of cases, you know, we've always seen people have to give up those funds to those teams and then they never see that again. And so there is yeah. that risk that whatever comes out of that, that ICO or whatever, uh, you know, may not be, a one-to-one -one value transfer or whatever. In this case, you, you're going to get those coins back, right? They're the original ones that you contribute as well as whatever comes out of the uh, the parachain auction, right? Yeah, exactly. So there, there's a couple of things to think about too with the way the model works. Because you have to um, contribute tokens to support the team, um, there are some trade-offs, of course, just like with any model. So you've got this, this parachain slot auction process solves many problems, creates 
skin in the game for the team. It reduces the risk um, for contributors to these to these events that are basically bootstrapping new teams. Um, the, the other on the other side of things, there's also um, quite a bit of economics to think about in terms of how these networks work. Since they're proof of stake, like Kusama, people are staking their KSM, maybe earning 12% or 15% or mm-hmm. whatever it is on that day. Um, to contribute to these, you do have to unstake. So there's also some, um, there's a requirement for these contributors to be evaluating kind of deeply who they're supporting with their with their KSM because they know that they're giving up the staking rewards in order to, to contribute these to a team. So they have to be sure that they're backing a really solid team when making that decision. Yeah, I think that will be interesting because there will be so many options of different projects to see like how people actually measure those projects against each other and, and choose you know ones they want to support. I think yeah. there's a lot to that community building aspect of it. So why don't you like, I mean, do you have, this is like a pretty complex process. Like in your mind, like, is there any way that like you can kind of break it down for like the average person to kind of like really understand how does this like work? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, one analogy that I, that I started using is um, like I mentioned on Kusama, let's, let's keep to Kusama for this example. Um, you've got all these, these parachain slots that a lot of people want because of the value that, that Kusama brings to their, their parachain. Um, these are these first slots are the, the very first slots opening up on the network. So obviously there's high demand for those slots. Um, I've kind of compared it to a, like a huge sporting event. If you can imagine like the world cup, uh, maybe the one in, in Brazil where there's thousands and thousands of people coming and people are probably parking miles or kilometers away, um, to, to, and then walking to the stadium and it's a pain. Maybe farther. So social yeah. distancing, you know, you got to exactly. even farther. So <laughs> imagine there's, but imagine there's like five spots, five parking spots, VIP. They come with whatever, all you can eat, all you can drink. And they're right next to the stadium. And you just have to walk 10 steps to get into the world cup. It's, you know, very high demand. A lot of people would want those spots. So um, just, Imagine there's there's these five spots, and how do you determine who gets these spots? Of course, you could you could sell them, but in this case, let's let's just go with this example and, and imagine there's a there's an auction in the parking lot for these five slots or these five spots, um, and people are bidding on who gets the spot. The highest bidder at the end of X amount of time wins the spot, and in this case, on this slide, the pink Range Rover wins slot number one for the highest bid. Um, this is very similar to how it works on Polkadot and Kusama because there's a limited amount of space. Each spot has extremely high value in terms of what it brings to the team who wants that spot. And that is essentially what parachain slot auctions are and this process that we're about to start seeing first on Kusama. Um, this, the first period of this will be five, five slots opening up um, in, in sequence. And then Polkadot will start soon after that. Um, the reason why this is so important for everyone to start learning about is because this is going to be an ongoing process on Polkadot and Kusama in parallel for the foreseeable future, for five, 10 plus years, depending on how governance takes these networks. So this is, it's a, it's a really exciting process and, and really important process for, especially for the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystems. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's, it's pretty... Like I said, it's kind of complex, but in a way it, it seems clear when you like look at it closely. Um, you know, one thing that will be interesting too to see is, you know, each team has a lot of flexibility in how they strategize around bidding on these slots, timing, you know, rewards, all these different mm-hmm. things. And so understanding the core principles of how these auctions work is going to be important for people who want to uh, participate for sure. Yeah, exactly. Because when when people are supporting a team in this in this auction to help support their bid, um, like I said, they need to evaluate the quality of the team, the product that the team is actually bringing to market. Um, but then they also there's part of the decision making around what the team is kind of offering in terms of um, the rewards or the incentives for backing that team. So um, some teams may be giving like a, in a cer- certain ratio of their native token to the number of KSM that are contributed in that, that parachain auction process. So 
yeah, a lot of kind of data points that people need to take into consideration um, when, when they start this process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, so maybe, uh, maybe we can just dive in a little bit more into like the actual auctions themselves. Like, like why, why, why are they even doing this in like an auction format? Like why not just allow people to rush in and do all these slots together at the same time? You mm-hmm. know, if they're going to do a hundred, why not just do them now? Is there like some strategy there around why they're doing it that way? And like, how does it even work? Yeah. Um, the, I guess the reasoning behind why auctions, especially um, the type of auction that this will be is, which is called an unpermissioned candle auction. Um, this is something that I, I think you and I both <laughs> might not have thought about or, or came up with, but these guys at Web3 <laughs> Foundation, the researchers there, um, like Al, Jeff, like these guys uh, are, you know, off the charts, brilliant researchers, like some of the best crypto researchers in the world. And Came up with this. Um, came up with this mechanism. Also, with I know Sean Tabrizi had had a lot of um, effort in this too. Um, to to have this auction style, where the the reason why it's called an unpermissioned candle auction is because during the auction, and I can show you this on a slide in a bit, but you don't actually know when the winner will be determined. That's randomly selected at the end of the auction. They wanted a way to avoid people trying to wait to the very last second and snipe in with a really high bid. When you don't know necessarily who, what time the, the winner will be selected, it, it forces people, again, back to game theory, it forces people to, to put in their highest possible bid as early as possible and try to maintain that lead because they don't know when the winner will be selected. Yeah, when I found out about that mechanism, I was very disappointed because like my absolute favorite part of eBay is like when people come in yeah. and steal the item out from under you at the last second. That's yeah, it's no, fun. no. But in you know, joking aside, I think that's like actually a really interesting mechanic for doing it. I mean, I know they had to go back to the 1800s or whatever to, to pull in that uh yeah. that that concept, but you know, by randomizing it, yeah, it definitely does seem to make it a lot fairer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Just going back to the um, how how you can actually win these auctions because it's I guess this is an important point. So there's there's two ways that you can bid. Um, let's imagine the auction starts tomorrow, and I'm a team planning on how to how to like strategize for the auction. If I have a lot of KSM as a team already, I can use that KSM as my bid in the auction. Um, Going back to the parking lot example, I, I could be somebody who has a lot of dollars and I can actually bid myself. Or what I can do is if I have 50 people behind me in the parking lot who also want to maybe get the benefits of that all you can eat, all you can drink that I'm going to get for my spot, I can raise all the money from them, those 50 people and bid with their with what they contributed to me. And then we all kind of share that. that those are the two options, self-bid with one account or like a whale account. And then the other one is um, what is actually in the substrate code base is called a crowd loan module. So the crowd loan is a way to crowdsource KSM or DOT in Polkadot's case to bid in the auction. Um, now for how the actual candle auction works. So you were just asking about that. And this slide here helps a lot with how that's actually gonna work. This is specific to Kusama. Um, today is May 27th, this might, change in in a few months. But as of now, when Kusama's first parachain auctions are starting, um, this is what's going to happen. Um, And it's fairly complex. So this let's go through this, this slide real quick. So when, when we finally get the announcement about the beginning of parachain auctions, we're going to be there's, there's like two dates that I'm going to be looking for, which is the opening time. So this is the very start of the auction. And then the close time, which is basically exactly seven days later. So the auction period will be seven days. And throughout the time leading up to the event and even during the event, every team will be um, kind of crowdsourcing KSM from their communities if that's how they chose to to raise the, or to to bid. Some teams may have their own KSM and and be bidding that way. But there will be a two-day opening period and then a five-day ending period. And what that means is that during the opening period here, we know that the winner will not be selected during that time. 
but during the five day ending period, the winner could be chosen at any time, but that time won't be known until the very end. So the most exciting part, the most like sporting event type moment is the end of day seven, because at this known close time, this is when everyone will be watching on the edge of their seats, waiting to see which block was chosen as the ending time for the auction. And then who, which parachain team had the highest bid at that moment in time. So in a very simplistic example where there's only what five bids in this auction, the randomly selected time was announced on this day on day seven and was this red line here, which looks like maybe day, what, three, four, five or six. The highest bid before that ending time was 55,000 KSM from Parachain A. So Parachain A unknowingly won the auction at this point, even though Parachain E and F had higher bids after that randomly selected time. So it seems like it would be like you would prioritize a bigger bid as quickly as you could within that ending period. Yeah. Um, in order to, you know, have the best chance of winning. Can a team bid multiple times in an auction? Yep. So teams can bid multiple times. And like, like I was mentioning, the um, people can contribute more to that cr crowd loan module, which is how the team is bidding. So if, if the team is at 55K, somebody could put in 10 more, 10,000 KSM and raise the bid to 65,000 KSM at this point. Um, so that the, I think like in terms of how a team in the most ideal scenario, you would basically start, you would make sure that you're winning at the beginning of day three, and then you would maintain that lead throughout the entire five day ending period, because then you know that you have 0% chance of losing if you're winning during that whole period. Well, let me ask you this. This is a, like a weird question. If, if, if you put in 55 K and that was the winning bid, but later in the auction past the randomly selected end time, you put in another 25 K, uh, yeah. do you, are you committed to put all those into the auction or is it just where, it, what value you had at the time the candle auction ends? Yeah. So it's a great question as a team. It doesn't count towards our, um, winning bid because we didn't need it. You know, like mm -hmm. if the bid was after that, maybe we ended with the total at um, 85,000 was contributed to us, but we won with 55. So it doesn't impact the auction result itself because it just kind of doesn't matter because it was after, but for the community, for the contributors, if, if I contributed 10,000 KSM after that point in time, I would still be like eligible for the rewards and the, the native token of that team. So the, the teams, yeah. it's probably going to happen that way for most teams. They're, they're winning the team who wins their total amount contributed to them. will could be more than the amount that they actually won the auction with. Okay. So anybody yeah. who is after that big red line is not going to lose out on rewards potentially yeah. as long yeah. as they're within the auction period. Exactly. Okay. Yep. That's great to know. Yep. So maybe this, maybe I can show you this real quick, just to summarize, like, this is a lot of information. And I think these visuals help to tie everything together. So this is basically start to finish where um, this module within substrate called crowd loan opens up. And this is how people can contribute. These could be any users. These can be Kraken users contributing their KSM to any parachain team. In this example, Karura. Um, and then this team, once they win the auction, in any auction this could be, um, then the, the KSM that was contributed to that parachain team is locked, like I mentioned before. And then at the same moment, the native token of that parachain is distributed to any contributor. And right around the same time, the network actually begins to launch. So the whole point of this auction process, going back to the first slide, is to win this slot in, in Kusama's network and then launch your, your blockchain and then potentially apps on top of the blockchain. This is then, this is a pretty presumptuous slide here. You got you winning already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. We don't know what, what auction yeah. it will be, but yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're hoping for it. Yeah. Um, so another question that people do ask is, 
It's one of the one of the things that is important to know is that you the KSM that's contributed is locked and then returned after the duration of the slot. In our case, we're going for a, a essentially one year. It's forty eight weeks, and there's a few things that can happen at the end of that period in time. Um, number one, we any team who launches on Kusama for for the most part will not want to give up that spot. So they'll need to win another auction after the, the year. So they can either do another um, kind of crowdsource event to raise KSM for the bid. Um, some teams um, like us, we have a, a treasury on chain. So we're actually going to be building up our own treasury so that in the future we can hopefully bid in an auction with our own on-chain treasury instead of having to do a crowd loan again. And then the third piece is um, a little bit more technical, but you can actually kind of downgrade in a sense to what's called a parathread. It's the same, almost the exact same concept as a parachain. You can, it, everything will look the same, but the only difference is that it's kind of like a pay as you go model with, with the amount of, with the frequency of access you get to the blockchain itself of, of Kusama. So you, you could be doing like a specific number of blocks instead of always having constant 24 seven access to the Kusama relay chain. Yeah. I think that those concepts I think can be pretty hard to wrap your head around, but you know, you know, realistically that's all part of the shared security model, right? Is like being able to have these leases where people have mm -hmm. a fair shot at, at using the finite resources of the blockchain. Um, and that, that's really, that's really, uh, pretty fascinating. I think it separates what Polkadot is doing from, you know, a lot of these other projects out there. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be fun to watch. Um, another, just on this topic, another question that people sometimes ask is, so there's, there's going to be auction number one, auction number two, of course, three, four, five, and, and so on. But what happens if a team does not win the first auction that they attempt to win? Does, does the KSM that was contributed to them immediately get returned to everyone? And then that team has to go out and do it again? Um, the answer is no, because that would just be a, a pain. And if you're supporting a team, you should be willing to support them through a series of auction attempts, not just one. Because if you've already done the research and you've decided that that's a team that you want to support, you should give them a chance to win, um, you know, over the course of maybe three or four different auctions. So, and only one can win, right? In in like a week period, or are there going to be multiple? <laughs> well, the, for the first ones, it'll most likely just be one team. Yeah. Um, when I mentioned it's a forty-eight week slot, that is actually eight six-week slots that are kind of combined. So. I'm, I'm guessing that most of the teams that launch um, in the beginning will be going for the full amount of 48 weeks. But in the future, if there is like a highly experimental parachain that doesn't want to stay on Kusama for too long, they could actually bid for like one slot or two slots and, and just be on Kusama for like six weeks or 12 weeks instead of the full 48. So then in that case, you could have two winners within one auction. But this is... This is getting into the details. That's really interesting. I mean, do you, yeah. do you think that there will be teams that really just kind of think of their their time on Kusama as like this short-term kind of test scenario for them? Or, or will these things, do you think, continue to survive on Kusama and be also on Polkadot? Because most of the projects you see in this space, they have like, you know, you have Akala and Karura and you have mm -hmm. Fala and Khala. And like, yeah. you know, there's all these projects that have both or they're planning to yep. do both, but do you see them kind of coexisting or like maybe only spend a short time on, on Kusama and then migrate to Polkadot? Yeah. The, so there's going to be, there's not just one rule. There's going to be multiple kind of scenarios actually in the, in the kind of what is Kusama video I did with you guys, there's some slides in that video around these different paths that a developer team could take. Um, one of those is, Akala Karura, Moonbeam, Moon, Moon River, like we're going parallel networks that are going to exist together um, forever. Um, we plan on having both just because there's a lot of advantages of doing that and both networks have demand for our products. The other, the other path is Testnet to Kusama to Polkadot 
So this could be a team who's using Kusama to like really see how everything operates in the real world with real value. And then once they have kind of figured everything out, then they move on to like maybe the big leagues, you could call it, to Polkadot. Um, and then kind of don't, you know, don't have a network anymore on Kusama. And then the third option is you could have a team who only launches on Kusama. Like Kus they might be developers who love Kusama's um, the way it moves fast, it's experimental. They can just like iterate very quickly. Um, this could be maybe like gaming applications, social networking, things that don't need like crazy high bank grade security. Um, there's already a team, Zeitgeist, who's building a prediction market and they're building exclusively in the Kusama ecosystem. So I think we'll see more of that. But yeah, there's not like one set rule for um, how teams will approach that. And do you think that there's... Um... Like, what would be the rationale for someone to want to support both Kusama and Polkadot? Like, why? Like, someone watching this may say, "Well, I want bank grade security. I want to. I want to support my yeah. team when they get to Polkadot." Like, mm -hmm. what would be the rationale for like supporting Kusama as well, or, or you know, is yeah. it just an individual decision? No, like even for us as a team, um, we've chosen to go to support both networks because. For, for DeFi specifically, there's this whole com community of KSM holders um, that is kind of quite different and distinct from the Polkadot community now. So we're building Karura as this DeFi platform for the Kusama community, and that that demand won't go away. And then the same mm -hmm. goes for Polkadot. We're building Akala for the Polkadot community. And then just in the same, in the same kind of um, train of thought of, that Gav, Gavin had with why Kusama and Polkadot, these are the same way. They're both going to be coexisting too because Kusama makes Polkadot better and Polkadot makes Kusama better. So we see the we see our two kind of parachains the same way. We can build and test things on testnet, launch them on the Kusama-based parachain, and then launch on the Akala chain um, after that. So it, they really make each other better. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I I completely agree with you. And um, so so right now it is May twenty seventh, and you know the 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 auctions haven't been, the time hasn't been declared yet. When they're going to start those, the the crowd loans haven't started on chain yet. Um, maybe we, like you know a lot of people watching this may be like, well, how am I going to get to participate in this? And obviously, I'm a little bit biased here in this conversation because I do work at Kraken. And we're planning on supporting um, slot auction capabilities. So, um, and when we've been going back and forth, we're, our teams have been working together and, and talking to each other and like everybody's been sharing across all the different communities, you know, along with all the other uh, parachain teams. But like, how do you see this happening? Um, maybe you can like walk us through how this might work on Kraken. Yeah. Um, so it's actually pretty simple. Um, and from from my understanding, it's it's like a, you can really boil it down to three steps. Um, I've got this this slide here. Like, as I mentioned before, any portion, any percentage of your total KSM that you are deciding to to move into this um, parachain auction process will need to be unstaked. So I know in Kraken, it's super quick and nice. It takes like a few seconds. Yeah, we you have instant unst unstaking. Yeah, <laughs> unlike a lot but, of projects. Yeah, I mean. Just real quick, that that is a huge benefit of using Kraken for staking uh, Kusama and Polkadot. Just to tout that, because uh, on chain, right, it's seven days, I believe, unbonding yeah. period for staking. Mm -hmm. So you get instant unstaking on on Kraken. Just remember that. Yeah, it's actually it's huge for for Kusama. It's seven days unstaking, and then Polkadot, it's twenty eight on di on chain. So um, yeah, it's much much quicker on on Kraken. So. But you just you st do still have to do it. So you unstake um, whatever you are deciding to put into the parachain auctions. Then, um, kind of in parallel to that, I think people should be researching, like looking up these teams, um, even going in, like using their their apps that they've built, um, learning more about the teams. And then once once they've decided who to support, then it's really a matter of waiting for the actual process to begin, and then choosing to contribute to that, to whatever team that is. Um, once they contribute, then you really, it's a matter of kind of waiting for that team to hopefully for, for the contributor, for their team to win. And then as soon as that team will win, um, 
then the, the KSM that was contributed will be locked. And then um, upon launch of whatever parachain team or teams that is, then the native token from that team will then be distributed to the user. Yeah, I think it's going to be really cool. Um, you know, we're, you'll be able to get those rewards right in Kraken and, and uh, you know, participate very simply through that. So it's, we're really excited to be a part of this. Um, yeah, so like maybe you can walk us through this diagram a little bit and uh, explain to us like kind of how, how it functions. Yeah, so this just basically breaks down what we just talked through. So yeah. um, if people have Kusama or KSM or, or they can um, acquire it, then that would be in your Kraken account. And then whatever is going to be contributed would need to be unstaked. And then um, in this example, Karura um, would be the team that the, the person has chosen. If um, in the in the green check check mark here, if the team wins the auction, um, it could be um, a number of of attempts. Um, you'll see, I think, within the the Kraken interface, it'll tell you like the campaign duration, um, something of that sort, which tells you how long Karura would have to win an auction. Maybe it's um, a few weeks, four weeks, six weeks, um, and then if the team wins, then that KSM is bonded or or locked. Um, and then the KAR token would be distributed to the team. If Karura was to not win an auction within that specified duration, then the KSM would just simply be returned to the person who was supporting the project. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward process. And that, that slide that you just saw, that diagram, you can um, find that and a little bit more information about uh, the parachain auctions. If you go to kraken.com, you can Google Kraken parachain auctions and you'll find the link there with this diagram in a high res version if you want to look at it closely. So, um, so that was like a really, really comprehensive overview of like how the parachain auctions work. And I think um, hopefully this helped people watching this and listening to uh, the video. Uh, understand a little bit more about how this works and what the benefits are and why it's different than uh, most of the other types of uh, funding resources for, for project teams. I mean, there's a lot of teams in this space. I think I heard you pre previously when we chatted, uh, there's like, like 100 teams at least that are interested in participating on this, doing different kinds of things in identity and um, you know different types of projects it's going to be really exciting to see how they work because they all get to share the same core uh, blockchain security. And, uh, you know, that leaves these teams to be free and flexible to create really cool uh, logic outside of that. Um, so thank you so much for uh, coming on today and explain this to everybody. Um, we're really looking forward to the crowd loans and the auction starting. And I know that uh, you guys are super excited about Karura and Akala getting to participate in that. So we wish you good luck on that. We'll, I guess it'll be pretty soon. We'll get to see uh, how you do and we'll get to follow up and see if you were right on your guess that you guys are going to win that auction uh, on that one slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. And I, I just wanted to say too, um, it's been really impressive seeing Kraken like really take the lead on... Um, this whole like Polkadot and Kusama community, like being a part of even like this, helping educate the community on how parachain auctions work, how this whole process works. Um, you guys have a huge community and, and great reach and, and reputation in the industry. So thank you guys for, for really stepping up and helping um, spread the word on this. Well, on behalf of the team, we thank you for that, uh, that, that vote of confidence. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a journey and we're, we're looking forward to it starting anytime soon. If Gavin's watching this right now, come on, get these things started. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Dan. Yep. Thank you guys. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out the Parachain Auctions podcast hosted by Kraken, where we'll bring you to the cutting edge of crypto technologies with experts from around the world. Come with us as we go behind the scenes and explore the technology of tomorrow today.